dear ladies, dear gentlemen, this is AIPS. My name is Jura Osmets and will moderate this final stage of four seminars. We approach the end of the first AIPS digital seminar focused on the cost of reporting while female. We have reached a total of 102 countries and more than 500 of registrants. Today, we will talk about the gender backlash. Women journalists are twice as likely to be victims of violence for exercising their right to freedom or expression and for reasons of gender. Women journalists, whether they are working in an insecure context or in newsroom, face risks of physical assault, sexual harassment, rape and even murder. They are vulnerable to attacks not only from those attempting to silence their coverage, but also from sources, colleagues and others. So, today we will have four panelists about the team. Pamela will not be with us. And after that, we will give a floor to you, our listeners and our members. You know that you can raise the hand virtually, of course, on your right side of the screen. So we can start that even before all, panel, all four panelists will finish. You already know that uh, you have three minutes of time and you are aware that we will translate all the seminar on four languages, English, Spanish, French, and Arabic. Before we start, I will ask Mr. Gianni Merla, AIPS president, to address us. Gianni? Hello to everybody, dear colleagues. I apologize only for one thing, that today I have no tie and no jacket, because here it is so hot. So I hope that you allow me to stay without jacket today. You girls agree that I stay without jacket? Thank you very much, thank you very much. And so now, I'm very glad that we are, we are at the end of this long journey with our women colleagues. I think that in these days, in, in these two weeks, we have touched all the problem that everybody is facing in his normal life. Today, we have published on our website an article in which are reported many different uh, opinions of girls that has uh, really uh, face the real situation. And for this reason, under the title, undervalued and abused, the real life experience, underlying frustration of the female journalist. I think that is something that I invite you to go to read because our experience that maybe many of you, unfortunately, have uh, passed through. So I get that today is a very hot uh, uh, issue that we are discussing about. It is important that we work together to find new solution and to avoid that in the future other young generation of journalists can face the same problem. Because our duty is to, to, bet, to make a better future for everybody. I think that made me very proud of our association is that in this uh, seminar there are so many people from so different countries that are discussing about the same subject because the life is the same everywhere there is no change even in the difference of religion of culture and so on the problem is exactly the same and this problem we must solve all together so now let's go to begin even if somebody is still coming, but we have to rush because we, we cannot be late after two hours. Thank you very much. Yes, Jenny, you're right. And now our next uh, panelist, or not yet panelist, but uh, panelist will be, but next is AIPS Vice President from Kenya, Evelyn Wata. Eve? Thank you, Yura. Thank you, Jenny, for that nice introduction. I quite agree with you that, you know, We've come a long way as AIPS and we have to try to make it better for the people coming after us. And as you're talking, I'm reminded of my own experience. I remember as a young journalist working in one of the newsrooms, I'd sometimes be sent out very difficult assignments. And then when I'd come back, probably I've gotten it. I didn't think I would, it, would not, it would be hard for me not to get the story or get the interview that I set out to do. But I will not get the compliment like what I'd see the other men in the, uh, in the newsroom would get. They'd be told, ah, good job. Well done. I was told, ah, we knew you'd get it. 
because you're a woman. And you know, it's something that used to bother me. And at some point it irritated me. And I said, I'm not here as a woman, I'm here as a journalist. So if I went out and got a story, it's because of my journalistic skills. I didn't go out there and put my femininity on the table and said, okay, hi, how are you? Can you give me this story? No. So this is the reason why we at AIPS, we need to try and create better, you know, or just push for better working environment for the younger people who are coming after us. I'll not want someone to experience what we experience. I'm not old, but then my experience was very bad. And as Yura mentioned, one of the panelists will not be there. And uh, it's a pity because the IFJ, that is the International Federation of Journalists, are doing a very good job. And they've been working a lot uh, during the pandemic. And Pamela had shared with me a survey that Yura, please allow me to just spend two more minutes to share. And it's good that we decided to host the AIPS Women's Seminar this time, because I think during this pandemic, most of us have suffered a lot, a lot that you can imagine. It's difficult for everyone, but it's rather difficult for female journalists around the world. And the International uh, Federation of Journalists did a survey in June, and it said that, unfortunately, during this time, gender inequalities had increased in the media. So you had more women being fired, you had more women probably having their salaries reduced, you had more women working from home, so that meant that some of them are the main caregivers, so they have to take care of their children and they have to meet the deadlines, and the voters were not understanding. So it's been very difficult. I will share this um, survey with you, but then I'd just like to point out a few bits of it. Allow me to just open this. Um, one thing that really just caught my attention is that over the interview about 600 women journalists from around the world, and they said more than three quarter of the people who took the survey saw their level of stress increase during this time. Eve, we don't see it, we just see your, your photo, Eve. Oh, sorry, it's because, um, <laughs> it's because I'm trying it. to read this report. So I'll try and use my computer instead. There I am. <laughs> okay. So it said that, yeah, and the, le the level of stress increased because some of them were harassed a lot because now they're online more. And some of them are just stressed because of the deadline pressures and the home pressures. And more than, again, three quarter of them had sleeping problems, which are adversely affected their health. And the other thing that was quite interesting is that most of, the, most of them are attached to unions, unions and associations around the world. And unfortunately, none of them developed any strategies to help them tackle these problems or the gender inequalities during this time. So a lot of them have been alone, have felt alone. So it's quite important that we are ending on this note. So the gender backlash is something that is quite concerning, but it affects, it affects our work and it also affects our well-being. So I'm quite excited that this is the last step of our AIPS Women's Seminar, the gender backlash. It's tough, but I'm sure it's getting better. Look at us. The person who championed this seminar was a man, Ricardo Romani. The person who coordinated this seminar was a man, Gianni Mello, the AIPS president. The person who's moderating this seminar is a man, Yura. You see, it's changing and it can only get better. Thank you so much and enjoy the last session. Thank you, Eve. I agree with you totally. 
and I'm certainly very sorry that Pamela is not with us, but this is not the last thing that uh, AIPS will do for this team. So I'm pretty sure that it is only the last thing in, in uh, uh, July of uh, 2020, but uh, in the next months we will do it better. So now meet the panelists. Uh, already been with us, uh, it's Rika Roy, but I will introduce you anyway, her anyway. She has all closely followed, analyzed and reported on two decades of India and world sports. She currently works with New Delhi Television as deputy editor. In the past, she has also covered politics, legal and current affairs as an on-field reporter or broadcaster. So, Rika, please, we are listening to you. You know, thank you very much for that introduction. Really, really grateful. Hello and welcome to my esteemed colleagues. I'm extremely grateful to share this platform uh, with you. A big thank you to Mr. Gianni Marlo. Mr. Marlo, in our Thursday casuals, we'll try to make it a terrific Thursday today. And uh, Mr. Sabanaikan, the former president of uh, SJFI, thank you to you. You. He is also India's representative to APES. A big thanks to my colleagues, senior colleagues at the Sports Journalist Federation of India, who has given me this opportunity and is listening to me right now. This is the second time I get to speak on the um, AIPS platform. My topic today is something that many Indian and Asian women feel very, very closely about. It is gender backlash. Now, I don't know um, what is the most often question that your moms ask you. But my mom, who is a medical professional and uh, who is extremely um, aware about human body's input and output ratio, often asks me, at least in a day, she asks me, how many times have I used the washroom? And my answers would more often than not meet with the response, not good enough. And I felt very strongly about discussing this on this platform to talk about it because one of the ways of keeping women journalists out and women athletes out of the stadiums and the fields of play is by keeping the washroom locked. Now, as a journalist, I have visited several countries. I have traveled to several corners of the subcontinent. And the biggest challenge that I have faced in the subcontinent is lack of understanding of women's health and sanitation issues. More often than not, uh, state, uh, uh, washrooms in stadiums and sports complexes do not um, open. Funnily enough, a lot of them do have women's washrooms, but they are locked. I don't know why. Now, I can tell you the story of an athlete who I had gone to interview um, sometime around May 2018 during a boxing event in New Delhi. And she kept me waiting for about two hours while I kept calling her. She kept texting saying that, wait, I'll come back and do the interview. She never came back. It was her practice day before a crucial boxing championship match. She needed to be in the zone, but here's what, hap what, what was happening in the background. Now, after the morning practice, um, she went to the washroom to find out that it was locked. When she complained to the authorities in the stadium, they asked her to use the men's facility and said the best that they could do for her was to have a woman stand outside and guard the washroom while she was inside and all the other men waited outside. Outraged and angry, she left the stadium went back to a hostel. She never came that, back on that day for her second practice session. She never arrived for the physiotherapy. Next day, she lost the match. This is one of the story, stories from India's sporting scene. I can give you many, many more. Now, most coaches tell their words that losing is not an option. For Even for journalists like me, coming back without a story, coming back empty-handed is not an option. But one of the first things about gender backlash is not providing the required infrastructure. Keep the washrooms locked, keep the women out. Despite the example I gave you, I can tell you um, Indian women athletes, Indian women journalists today still have better facilities than our counterparts in the subcontinent. The infrastructure required by women athletes in countries like Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, are far from met. Now, I was speaking to an under-19 woman cricketer from Pakistan 
and she said that money is always an issue and parents need to support the kids all the way through which is why mostly girls from elite backgrounds succeed in sport while the other issue and this is a big issue is dropouts a lot of parents do not consider sports to be a safe profession this is true to journalism as well uh, gender based violence is very high in the subcontinent i cannot give you a statistics of how many sports people or how many uh, women journalists left the profession just because of gender based violence but there are so many instances and i keep hearing so many stories the indian women's football team is ranked higher than the N indian men's football team in the fifa rankings and most of these girls they're not professionals they have a day job they only practice in the evening they play football tournaments as amateurs the under 17 fifa women's world cup will be held in india next year it got pushed from this year to the next year because of the coronavirus pandemic it is one of the marquee events on in india's sporting calendar but hardly any talk about it in the media and it isn't just the men the women journalists are also not talking about it um and i can tell you the reason behind it the editors in our newsrooms feel that till the time there is buzz around the tournament there is talk about the tournament no point in filling columns in the newspapers or giving it air time uh, because they think that there is no peg and what is the peg is the oft repeated question uh, this brings me to my point uh, on media playing a key role a very important role in the development of sports in the region one of the reasons that the sports scene for women has not developed in india and subcontinent is because um the women uh, uh, sports people have not got the space in the media consistently countries like india pakistan bangladesh sri lanka nepal do not have a culture of sports it is this generation of parents who think that sports for their children can become a profession not having sports culture do not uh, 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 mean that we do not follow sports we only and only follow achievers now cricket in the subcontinent of course is an exception because cricket is a religion the success of indian women athletes in the rio olympic games of 2016 and commonwealth games in gold quest in 2018 have got media talking about uh, the indian girls pv sindhu Saina Nehwal, uh, uh, Sakshi Malik uh, became household names. MC Maricom, Sania Mirza too have had their share of international achievements. Their stories have been told a million times. Now the Indian women's cricket team came second to Australia in the uh, T20 World Cup earlier this year, and uh, they were picked up by a bunch of followers on social media due to the brand of cricket they displayed. today the presence of social media has changed the way we do our journalism as women journalists too we need to get creative and we need to redefine our roles when editors refuse to carry our stories uh, and stories of young achievers they can be told through social media the subcontinent has the advantage of huge population we need to build our reader base we need to build our follower base on social media with workstations now shifting home in the future many more journalists will perhaps work from home work as freelancers hence there is a need urgent need to start using social media better and i i can tell this um, uh, this this is something that uh, the indian and the subcontinental journalists need to pick up from now i see a lot less uh, being on the uh, social media platform than the ones in the west the ones that will tell good stories and have good content to share will get paid more than the others now the coronavirus induced pause is the time to carefully craft our future as women journalists and sports journalists recognition for our efforts and money are two biggest motivators and both are very very hard to come by but as the world gets flatter due to connectivity and we move out of newsrooms that are governed by a structure i feel talent will get noticed mediocrity will be shunned in the due process now gender based violence discrimination and nepotism will take years to go but i'm hopeful that talent 
will need opportunity in this day and age of what being wired by Wi-Fi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rika. Interesting as always. And now we will listen to Dorothy Njoroge. She is uh, the chairperson of Association of Media Women in Kenya and is also the head of the Journalism and Corporate Communication Department at the United States International University, Africa. She is an advocate for gender equality through her uh, activism, work on improving the status of women in media and advocacy for the elimination of gender-based violence. Dorothy, welcome. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be with you. And uh, I just want to add my voice to what has been shared before. And um, so we're talking about backlash and uh, where does it come from? Uh, we see that uh, women around the world have made uh, remarkable progress in all fields, whether it is, um, you know, politics, the corporate world, and so on. Uh, women have made tremendous progress. And because of this, uh, we see, uh, in fact, in this COVID era, we are talking a lot about women leaders, such as uh, Jacinda Arden of New Zealand, uh, Sai Ingwen of Taiwan, and Angela Merkel. And uh, so, we, so women are getting the spotlight, and uh, especially in fields that are considered to be a male preserve. And, uh, and this has led to uh, what we are calling now uh, a proliferation of negative action against women, otherwise known as backlash. And this takes many forms, and one of the forms is misogyny, you know, just the hatred of women. And this, as um, we've just been told, manifests in uh, gender-based violence uh, in the domestic spaces, but this, of course, has extended to the uh, to the public spaces and uh, even to the even to the workforce. Um, in in my country, Kenya, for example, the gender minister reported that uh, calls to the uh, gender violence hotline have actually gone up by 50 percent uh, during the COVID period. So unfortunately, we are seeing that this kind of escalation is hurting women. And, uh, we, and uh, there's a study that has been done on uh, Kenyan, South African, and Nigerian journalists. It was done in 2019 uh, by Infin Mulupi and uh, Lindsay Blamwell. And uh, women journalists in Kenya, 77.5% report that they have experienced uh, workplace uh, sexual harassment. In uh, South Africa, the figure stands at uh, 57.5, and in Nigeria at 38.1. So, so these actions are basically uh, a pushback by uh, by those experiencing male privilege to keep women out of um, the public space. Uh, currently, I am undertaking uh, a study on the impact of COVID-19 on women journalists in East Africa been carrying out a survey and uh, some focus group discussions. And uh, just like uh, has been reported, uh, women have really been affected by this. Uh, in terms of gender-based violence, women report within East Africa, women journalists report they have experienced less of it. However, the online violence has gone up because, uh, of course, most journalists have migrated to operating online. And uh, they are reporting many kinds of attacks, including body shaming, name calling, and so on, uh, online stalking and threats. And this has really affected uh, the way they work. Um, additionally, uh, women have reported to have been uh, disproportionately affected um, in the layoffs that happened after uh, COVID began. And uh, basically, the <laughs> We were trying to probe uh, why do you think women have been disproportionately affected in this region? And uh, many were saying the criteria used for laying off journalists or following, following journalists and asking them to stay at home was basically gender. And um, it was basically the assumption that women uh, have male caretakers so they will manage if they are laid off. Uh, there was also the discussion that uh, women journalists uh, should be protected uh, uh, from 
risk, you know, they cannot be sent to the field. It's more risky for them, so they were sent home. And, uh, and all the fact also that women have domestic duties and therefore they are not as available as men. So those are some of the reasons that were given uh, to, to lay off women or to put them on unpaid leave. And we see at least half of the women that we've talked to have had, uh, have either, are either at home or they're working for free, hoping that things will improve, and then they're going to get uh, paid. When we ask them, 81% of them say they feel very insecure, even those who are still working, they feel very insecure about their work. And uh, about, um, and many of them, uh, about 51% of them, are worried about their own uh, welfare. Uh, many of them say that they're not getting any kind of protection uh, when they go, when they work, those who are still working, they have to take care of their own protective gear when they go out to, to, to the field. And uh, many of them are experiencing a lot of stress because they have to work in the house and at the same time they, they have their children and family to take care of. So that, um, you know, balancing between working and taking care of the kids is taking a stress on the, on the life of the family and they don't have any sort of support to help them to navigate this kind of stress. Uh, half of, uh, about 43% say that they are not getting any kind of psychological support from the employer, so they depend on, uh, on family or general, journalism, uh, journalistic associations to help them to be able to to, to survive. So, uh, so the whole issue of backlash is not new. Uh, it has been there for a long time. And uh, Susan Faludi, in her book called Backlash, which I believe many of you have said, uh, it says that backlash is basically trying to push back on the achievements that women have made. And this is done by trying to demonize uh, feminism by saying that. Uh, the problems women are experiencing have been caused by feminism, and you have, and therefore many women actually even not wanting to call themselves uh, journalists. And, I mean, feminists anymore, and therefore, um, yeah, feminist um, the backlash is also exhibited in uh, ensuring that women stay in the lower, lower positions when they uh, enter into the workforce in journalism. So you find that they are, they are not decision makers, and that's one of the things they were saying in this uh, in this uh, focus group we had. And they, they don't uh, they don't make decisions about the conditions at work. So uh, the government requires nursing stations, for example, in Kenya. But you go you visit many uh, news organizations; they do not have nursing stations. So women either have to stay at home, and they were telling us that sometimes they choose less demanding assignments. To ensure that they are able to balance their home life and their work life. And basically they said because of their home life and work life balance, they are considered problems. Instead of um, them being seen as people having particular needs that should be taken care of, they are basically uh, perceived as problems. And therefore, uh, part of some of the solutions they were recommending was that uh, women really need to have strong um, networks and associations to be able to support each other and to be able to speak with one voice so that women can be able to do better and to succeed because they feel that the voice of women in journalism is critical. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dorothy. You analyze it very good with a lot of uh, numbers. I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, we would like to have those numbers also written if you can to send it to our at least website or maybe our magazine. Thank you very much for this. And now we are going to Georgina Ruiz Sandoval, known as the voice of cycling in Latin America. She has broadcasted 19 tours of France uninterruptedly in addition to four Giro d'Italia and five to the Spain, as well as other races on the world tour calendar. She has also covered the Olympic Games, Pan American Games and Central American and Caribbean Games, as well as World Athletics Championships. Georgina, welcome. Thank you so much, Jura. Uh, I would like to, um, to take uh, this opportunity to uh, say hello to everybody. This is my first appearance in one of these uh, AIPS seminars, so it's um, a little 
on Derby right now. Um, I'm used to talk to the camera, but now I know you're you're here for a purpose, and I really want to uh, express my my gratitude to these uh, magnificent uh, colleagues that are here sharing this, their stories and their points of view. Thank you to Mr. Gianni Merlo for organizing this and to Connie Mora, a colleague of mine that suggested my name, so that's why I'm here. And I would like to, to share some thoughts about this backlash. And um, I was listening very close to Rika's uh, um, words. And I think um, most, for most of us, the, the experience with even sports, it's traumatic. Even even before we we go to to the university and and try to to have a college degree, because in in Latin America mostly the the, the classes for um, uh, physical education they are they are not not as good as, as they should and uh, girls they feel intimidated, body shame, and I think uh, we need to change that so we can absorb the sports experience and then. We, we can have a base, uh, like lots of girls wanting to, to come in in this kind of uh, reporting sports because they, they, they had a good experience since they were child. So I, I, I think that that would be good. Um, when I started studying journalism in Mexico, my dreams was to transcend an area that seems mysterious and forbidden for women in my country. Little did I know that this path that I chose will bring me fulfillment, extensive travel, and experience with different traits and cultures. The college degree in journalism in Mexico for a long time was not considered even a career, but a trade. Specialization was not available. Sports sections were viewed as an entry level and not necessarily as a serious career path. My fascination with sports came directly from watching TV as a kid. And uh, when I heard uh, the broadcasters, I wonder if that could be me someday. My favorite sports in Mexico uh, was the American football. I know it's a little odd, but it, it was my favorite, <laughs> which is very popular in Mexico. And um, there's a college league in Mexico. As a student at the university, I used to go to these league games and ask for an opportunity to grab the mic and start commenting right there in the stadiums. Some men yelled back at me and said, shut, shut up, shut up, shut up, and leave the microphone to a man. This hurt at first, I was 18, but I was not going to let that deter me from going on. Everybody saw me as a curiosity. Mm, I was continually asking advice for, from coaches walking the silence, trying to absorb the, the sport. And when, when it was time to practice, um, I asked for, for a chance to call on a, a, a game. And my boss in, in that time, in a modest government funded TV station, they, they gave me the, the opportunity and I could do it. Um, I, I knew I was perceived as an anomaly because I was a woman. I spent the first years trying to perform my, my best at work, trying to blend with co-workers, mostly men. I thought my image, uh, it was something that I had to cultivate like strongly. But later on, I discovered that my real input would be my preparation, my point of view, my, my, and my voice. That's, that has been my best vehicle. Um, when I went to the Tour de France for the first time in the early 90s, in those years, women were absent in the press room. And although the event was uh, a significant point in my career, I felt a little out of place. Many look at me in disbelief as if in Mexico, women sports journalists did not exist. Cycling has become my specialization and a way of life. After that experience, I decided I would become the first woman to call a race. Since then, I have succeeded and, and I'm so, so, so happy to, to have done it, but there's still work to do. 
Uh, I, I'm working for a TV channel, two TV channels in Colombia as a main play-by-play -play in life cycling events. This sport has become an essential property in Colombia and Latin America because it's, they are very successful. And I'm grateful to be the number one broadcaster in a country that is not mine, in among, among a mainly, main, mainly men uh, sports broadcasters community. I have been fortunate not to experience physical violence during these 30 years of professional career, but I have been able to repel some sexual advances. But I know circumstances are not the same for every colleague and for those who have been subject to the worst forms of oppression and violence, I can only say it's not fair and genuinely despicable. At a distance, the environment in sports coverage may seem safe and not violent. However, words and attitudes in this work environment can compel any young journalist to submit, lack opportunities to grow, and the destruction of self-esteem. Although we have been able to access sport fields, many colleagues places, is they, they are put in the second row, the, their presence goes unnoticed and raising their hands is less visible. Participating in post-match uh, post coverage in locker rooms means that you have to accept any attitude and psychological abuse as a woman. It is a bubble where the athletes are empowered because they are in their terrain and some women have to distract their gaze due to the lack of modesty of some of these athletes. Practically, they expose themselves sometimes. In this environment, many are waiting for the women's journalist reaction taking away professionalism from the work environment and proper coverage diminishes. On other occasions, we are subject of judgmental, judgmental stares about the wardrobe we choose, the hairstyle, the makeup, and we can perceive whether the athletes or, and, and coaches are not taking us, taking us seriously. We can sense that they are whispering, even in other languages, if you're foreign, they are making comments out of color. On top of facing those uncomfortable circumstances, one, you. You have to focus on doing a good job and try to make a difference. In addition to hostile environments, many reporters have had prevented sexual advances sorry, for, uh, from colleagues, bosses, and athletes. It is challenging for a woman to find the middle ground and draw a line in the work environment. It is difficult when a refusal to certain advances becomes persecution and derives into a lack of professional development. When you belong to a group where men have the majority, it is a test to your abilities to feel within that community. One has to counterbalance with constant participation, firmness, and even a sense of humor. You don't decide in which box they are going to place you, and that leaves you with a tough task on how to get out of that box and advance professionally. Words can be as violent as physical assault. Pejorative phrases and actions to demin uh, diminishes a woman journalists work and end up frustrating her, her career and disenchanting promising careers. Many of us receive only assignments to our, uh, that our male colleagues are not interested in or maybe they are not the sports with a mass impact. The feeling of not being measured with the same standard is evident. In these cases, you have to take advantage of that window of opportunity and avoid standing in the longest line. For a female journalist, there is nothing worse than to feel that her interviews and editorial concepts are perceived as soft and with no substance. And that feeling has been magnified thanks to social platforms where there is no filter for attacks. One has to be aware that the image of a photo 
or a phrase can create judgment perhaps different from the reality of a professional. The social platforms give anonym, anon, anonymity to sexual advances, profanity, and it is easy for anybody to decertify de de your work. Sometimes the false perception and rumor spreading in the, in the sports and media community could damage a career permanently. It is challenging for many of, our, of my colleagues to go reporting and be there dressed presentable, but not too revealing, to smile enough, to be friendly, but not to give the wrong impression. In Latin America, the, the, woman, the woman figure is divided in a very primal way. On, on this side, there are sisters, mothers, official girlfriends in this side, and the other side, there's everybody else. Some women agree to their objectification in media in exchange for a short-lived career and some fame. Sometimes the word journalist is also trivialized and is applied to anyone with a microphone and a camera. I genuinely believe that, some, that sometimes fighting alone is not possible. We have to resort to an association such as this one. We are participating in the seminar, AIPS, or a local or a national journalism organization to ask for advice. Don't be alone. We need to work together and get empowered. Thank you. Very good message. Thank you, Goga. Don't be alone. It's a strong message and I think uh, everybody will listen to that. Uh, to everybody of you who are still with us or uh, just uh, came to us, uh, please be prepared. We have just one more panelist and uh, uh, after that, we will uh, ask you to have your opinion. So please go down to your screen, uh, print the participants button and then on the right side of your screen, you will see the rise hand button. Then if you want to ask or to talk with us. And our last panelist for today is Christine Brenner. We know her. She's an award-winning national sport columnist for USA Today, a commentator for CNN, ABC News, PBS NewsHour and National Public Radio, a best-selling author and a nationally known speaker, writes several books. Christine, welcome again. Well, thank you. Hi, everybody. Such an honor to be here. And, and uh, Johnny, I know you were the one who got us going on this. So a huge thank you, my friend, uh, for, for championing uh, this, this uh, seminar and for helping so many of us. So thanks to uh, AIPS, thank you, Kara, thank you. Uh, and hello to all my friends and colleagues. I'm still amazed that around the world, here we are talking. Um, the best thing about the pandemic is Zoom, I think uh, we can say that. Um, Anyway, a few thoughts from me on this topic, and then I know uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people who we'd like to hear from and hear your questions and hear your, your experiences as well. You know, I, uh, you've heard me talk about my love of sports journalism. Uh, it, it's the greatest adventure of a lifetime. It's just the best way to combine your love of sports and writing and broadcasting into the career of your dreams. I believe that with my heart, and I've, I've lived that myself. But let's not sugarcoat a very big issue that remains for women in sports media, and that is sexual harassment and verbal abuse, and of course, outright sexism as well. We all have our stories. We've heard some from my, my esteemed colleagues so far this morning. We've all dealt with it. Uh, the snide, nasty remarks from fans or colleagues uh, on Twitter, uh, the sexist comments on social media. You know, I can't tell you how many times some man has sent a tweet to me telling me to go back to the kitchen where I belong. And I thought, oh, no, 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 no. You do not want me there. You do not want me in the kitchen. I'm not a good cook. And I smile, right? I'm, I'm smiling now as I tell the story. Of course, it's ridiculous that they say that. Of course, it's demeaning. Of course, it's sexist. But it is even a little funny to me just because I can turn it around on them and, and uh, hopefully not take it seriously and have a, a little laugh uh, at their sexism. That might be funny, but this is not. 
I was the Washington Post beat writer covering the Washington National Football League team for three seasons, from 1985 to 1987, ending with the 1988 Super Bowl. Back then, the owner of the team, Jack Kent Cook, would sometimes pat me on the head. And by the way, that's not an easy thing uh, for him to do when I'm 5'11", almost six feet tall, uh, several inch inches taller than he was. He was about 5'7", or so. So he had to really reach high to pat me on the head. He would talk about my clothes, he would talk about my hair, and I smiled and tried to ignore it, which is what women did back then, uh, while charging right ahead with the questions that I had for him. I was not going to be stopped. Um, Jack Ken Cook, the owner, he would laugh and answer half of my questions. Twice, the owner of the team, and again, this is back in the 1980s, but twice, the owner of the team, Jack Ken Cook, kissed me. He shook all the male reporters' hands, but then he would lean in for a kiss with me. And both times I was able to turn my head and take it on the cheek. He eventually stopped, he got the hint, and he stopped doing that and he simply gave me a firm handshake just as he gave all the male reporters. And of course I was the only woman there uh, back then at those practices and, and those events. That's what happened back in the 1980s. The team's general manager was a man named Bobby Bethard. And he made it clear early on that he didn't want a woman covering the team. He said to me, it messes up everything that they're sending you out here, meaning the Washington Post sending me to cover the Washington NFL team. The name, of course, is racist, and they've now gotten rid of it. I'm not going to say it here. So Bobby Bethard was concerned about my presence in the locker room, which, of course, was a place where reporters interviewed the players. It was the workplace for me. I told him I had no problems with it. And he said, kept going, he said, I know you're a nice girl and I know you don't really want to be in there. And I told him again that it was not an issue for me. As for the players themselves, I had about a dozen of them ask me out on dates. These are National Football League players. Some of them were married and some were not. Uh, maybe I should have expected this, uh, but I didn't, at least at first. I politely was able to get through it by saying, no, I covered the team. I'm a journalist covering the team. This is business, this is work, and I'm going to say no, thank you very much. In the 1980s, you did have to do it that way. You did have to be polite. What if I had to interview them the next day? You couldn't just blow them off or walk away the way you might at a bar or a restaurant or some other place. I had to continue to deal with all of these men. One night, right on deadline, I was all alone in the press room, uh, typing on my portable computer, the little tiny laptops we had back then. And I looked up and I saw a married member of the Washington NFL organization staring down at me, smiling. And he had a question for me. He said, do you stay at the same hotel as the team? And I said, yes. And then he said, would you like to get together this weekend? And it surprised me. I kept my wits about me. I said, no, thanks. And he pressed the issue. I politely stood my ground. Within a few seconds, he had turned, turned to go. But okay, good, that's over. But then he swung back toward me. Would it be okay if I kissed you, he asked me. And I, of course, said no, very as loudly as I could, as strongly as I could. I remind you, this was the workplace. He did leave, but this is, again, a man that I had to report on, a man that I had to interview, and he has turned the workplace into some kind of fraternity house or something. This was in 1987. It was a very different time, a time when you didn't mention these things. You didn't tell your editor about this. You didn't tell anyone else. It was a time when you tried to ignore the harassment and the sexism and keep right on going, which is exactly what I did. I had a college football coach kiss me in the ho a hotel hallway uh, on a road trip as we both walked to our respective rooms from the elevator. Didn't see that coming. Um, all of a sudden, we're just walking along chatting, and he pushes me against the wall and kisses me. I quickly got away from him and went into my room. I had to interview him the next day. I even had an editor on my first job kiss me in the parking lot before I could push him away. I couldn't believe it, but I still had to work with him. No one, ladies and gentlemen, spoke up about these things back then. All it would have done would have labeled me a complainer. Potentially, it would have derailed my career. So I kept right on going. Nothing was going to stop me. That was then. 
this is now. A story to finish off my comments. The Washington Post recently reported on the sexual harassment and verbal abuse of 15, 15 female employees of the Washington NFL team, that same team that I'm talking about from the 1980s. Also, the sexual harassment and verbal abuse of two women reporters who covered the team. The details were appalling and they were unacceptable. But here's the big difference. Here's the great news. Their terrible behavior was not ignored. In fact, it was reported by one of the United States' biggest and most prestigious newspapers, the Washington Post. Three men lost their jobs because of it. People were outraged. And most important, the women were believed and they were supported. There was safety in numbers, 17, 17 women in all coming together to speak out. I think we call that progress. Christine, thank you for sharing this experience with us. I'm pretty sure that uh, our uh, listeners and uh, our participants will have some questions, so stay with us. And now it is your time. Paloma Gutierrez, a young reporter from Mexico. Paloma, welcome. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be here. As you were mentioning, I was in an AIPS program where uh, luckily we were more girls covering the under-17 World Cup championships in Jordan. And I have a question to Golga, which uh, I consider a role model in my whole career. Actually, uh, is one of the women who gave me the strength to say, okay, I will study a career and do what I love and see what happens because I'm a girl and I know that it will be really complicated. Uh, you mentioned, Eugenia, about uh, the physical uh, problems that we have uh, in Mexico or in whole Latin America. How, as, as a woman journalist, can we change that perspective? How can we be the part that are not agree with that? Uh, you're working on e uh, ESPN, uh, a really important uh, company in sports in uh, Latin America and especially in Mexico. We still have a lot of uh, reporters who are there because they were queen in a beauty contest or things like that. How we change it and how was for you to gain there and win the place that you have with all your talent and professionalism? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Goga, it's your time. Muchas gracias, Paloma. Um, I, I, I think it's very, it's very difficult um, to be in, in, in this era, uh, in this uh, in time, because uh, the social platforms right now, they, they are doing not, not good for, for a, the, the journalist as a, as a person, as a, as, a, uh, as a word, as itself, because everybody calls themselves journalists just because they are just talking into a camera or they have a phone and, and that's very bad. So, and that makes, I think that makes that sometimes, uh, it's, it's easy to be a journalist then because you have the me you have the means and then you 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 do your stuff and then you have a youtube channel and everything i i i, I am fine and it's good for everybody to have a platform and to have a voice but to call themselves themselves journalists it's too much and uh, when when you're you're talking about some some of uh, some girls they they try to jump into the bandwagon right now sports they it's like to be in some place with like instant fame. And um, I think um, if you want to succeed in this, in this specifics uh, of uh, sports in, in media, you have to be consistent, you have to be patient, you have to raise your hand many times, you have to ask for more uh, responsibilities, you have to look for for uh, uh, items or um, maybe something different that is not in the in the common uh, knowledge uh, or the most um, uh, the, mo the 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 sports that they, they have mass impact such as so football or soccer you have to go in, into a, in, into another in uh, an, another tasks 
you you have to find yourself uh, uh, something different because if not then you're just just in in the biggest line and 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 that will only frustrate you you have to be prepared to be criticized you have to grow the thickest skin because uh, it's the only way to survive really and you have to trust yourself it this trust be, um, comes when when time comes along with you with 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 experience i i've been uh, 30 years uh in this <laughs> and um it's sometimes it's still difficult i know i have something for 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 myself right now but it's still difficult to to feel that some part part of the public they they don't believe me they still don't believe me because you, i'm just a, a girl in sports they don't know where I come from, if I studied, if I had so and so uh, experience, they don't care. But I, I, the only thing I, I can tell you is be patient, be trust yourself and uh, look for something different. Uh, maybe it's not the, the thing that you want right now, but it will get you there. Try, try to be original. Thank you, Goga. Paloma is satisfied, I see, with her smile. And now we are going to Ghana, Ayashatu Zakaria, and please, Tiana Jeftic from Serbia, be prepared after that. Ayashatu Zakaria. Oh, hi. So, uh, I was saying that back here in Africa, in Ghana, sometimes you go in to cover matches, and then these teams will not allow you to cover, because the belief is that you are a woman, and then when you are having your message, it's a form of a bad luck for them. Um, I want to find out if uh, any of them have experienced that. And also, uh, there's a situation of females actually trying to sabotage uh, young ones that are also coming up. Um, have they experienced that growing up? Because I experienced that sometimes uh, the male colleagues are trying to sabotage you. They are trying, they are insulting you, giving you all these bad names. But then, in some instances, there are females who are actually doing that to you, a fellow female. Did you also experience that? So is it a question for anybody or just an, uh, uh, a Anybody can take it. Yeah, anybody can take it. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe we should see from uh, Georgina. Goga or... Yeah. No? Yes, yes, okay. I, I, I can I can take it. Um, thank you so much for your comment. Yeah, I, I know um, uh, in Latin America there was a time that, that happened too. No, not everybody was able to go, not even in the, on the field, just in, in the stands. And um, I understand there's cultural differences in, in countries and, 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 and even continents, but um, uh, we, the only way we can fight is uh, try to 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 have an, a local association and and uh, try to make some impact in in local media as as a group. I think that's the only way we can protect our presence. And um, if we are polite and we are professional, there's no there's no way they they cannot allow us to to go and work. So we. I know we are frustrated, but we, we don't have to whine. We, we have to just be present, professional, and ask for, for things that, 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 that are just fair. So I, I hope you can, you can do that in, in, in your country, in Ghana. Yes, thank you, Goga. Maybe Dorothy also could have uh, some words about this, because uh, she's also an advocate. Uh, so maybe even from that uh, side of uh, view, Dorothy? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, we, we try to advocate directly with, uh, with uh, media, media organizations so that they can come up with uh, gender supportive policies. Uh, because when you're operating on your own as a lone journalist, you need support, and like we have said, from women organizations, but also from uh, you know strong support from your own organization. So if your organization is able to support you, is able to give you that uh, push and protection, then I think you can be able to do better. So again, uh, it's good to really advocate for uh, support within the organization uh, as, as a woman. 
Thank you, Dorothy. Now we are going to Serbia. Tiana Jevtic will have a question or just an opinion. And after that, El Salvador, Areli Franco, be prepared. Tiana? Hello to everybody. I'm first time with you and I want to say hello to all these women together also with the other colleagues. I will not uh, take too much time for uh, all of you. I don't have any question. I just want to say my opinion. First of all, I want to introduce myself. I'm 20 years in this uh, job. I'm TV sport commentator, presenter and journalist in Serbian broadcasting company. And I'm very happy that I can tell you that I didn't have any bad experience in my career for 20 years. And uh, I think all of us must to have uh, our personality. First of all, must have knowledge. And second of that, must have information. What it means? That means if you go for some event or you go for some uh, big competition, you must prepare your mind, yourself, and uh, take all information what you can use and with all of that you must go there in front of sportmen in front of other people from sport you must uh, have your personality and you must uh, uh, know what you want from that interview or from that uh, you must know question you must know everything and in that case everything uh, will be okay people uh, in sports will uh, recognize you like somebody who knows about what you speak and after uh, some years all of people and audience will trust you for everything in sport and i think uh, not uh, use your humanity too much just use smile and be positive and ask with smile very nice uh, words thank you very much tiana uh, it's you. very nice to hear that uh, my male colleagues from Serbian television is uh, so good to you because I know half of them. So it wouldn't be. <laughs> but hey, maybe we, are... we did. I, I, I didn't uh, recognize <laughs> that you are here, but okay, for me, it's very nice to hear you. I know other colleagues from your company, but I'm very happy on this way to uh, Thank you, see you. Thank, Thank you, Tiana. Now we are going to El Salvador. Areli, now it's your turn. And please. <laughs> We want to see you. We want to see your face. We, we don't want to see the letters on the screen. Gracias, lo siento mucho. Es que no tengo cámara. Lo mío okay. es, es un comentario y agradecer a todas. En la experiencia que he tenido, lastimosamente, nuestros pares masculinos es como lo que han expuesto, expuesto. Las colegas no respetan y si más bien han hecho este asunto del acoso. Yo trabajo en la única universidad pública que tiene mi país y la única que sirve el periodismo como tal. La única que también tiene eh, el área de periodismo deportivo y hay varias de nuestras exalumnas que trabajan en medios de comunicación y han roto brechas trabajando en medios, en programas deportivos de mi país. Y me parece importante que organizaciones como la de ustedes hagan esfuerzos porque precisamente se respeten los derechos de las mujeres para que puedan seguir incursionando y abriendo espacios y trabajando con el profesionalismo que debe hacerse porque somos iguales o incluso muchas de ellas mejores al hacer el trabajo de, de reporteo. Entonces, eh, eh, en mi país, lastimosamente, todavía se cosifica mucho a las mujeres que participan en programas porque ustedes pueden ver a mujeres vistiendo faldas cortas, blusas escotadas y no van a ver a, a hombres mostrando sus pectorales ante las pantallas. Entonces yo pienso de que sí es importante que desde quienes tienen puestos de dirección hagan algún esfuerzo para precisamente lograr que se respete nuestro trabajo como las profesionales que somos. Yo tengo un pequeño programa deportivo, transmito desde la radio universitaria y la verdad es que no he tenido tantos problemas en ese sentido, pero sí sé de colegas que constantemente están denunciando. Se hace también a través de la Asociación de Periodistas de El Salvador 
eh, tratando precisamente de cambiar esos estigmas de que las mujeres que nos dedicamos a los deportes no sabemos y que, y que lastimosamente todavía a esta altura del siglo XXI hay gente que piensa que pertenecemos a la cocina cuando eh, realmente nos interesa el deporte y tenemos capacidad para hablar acerca de ello y, y y también decir de que ahora que conocí un poco más de la historia de, de Georgina Ruiz, me, me agrada mucho. Es a alguien que yo escuché mucho en los tours de Francia, sus narraciones. Y bravo, porque la verdad es que vencer obstáculos no es fácil. Gracias a todos y, y éxitos. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, now we are going to Colombia. Yalinda Shantosh uh, will be with us. Uh, and after that, uh, Hazarika from India. But first, Colombia. Buenos días. Eh, mi, mi comentario va para, para la IPS nuevamente, eh, no, no específicamente para, para una panelista. Eh, es la insistir en que la IPS eh, realice actividades específicamente en Latinoamérica en Colombia, eh, para que eh, se incluyan a las mujeres, eh, periodistas mujeres, en estas actividades. Eh, y por otra parte, que las mujeres exitosas, las mujeres periodistas que son exitosas, como Georgina, eh, como Rica, como todas, eh, todas estas mujeres, eh, sean solidarias con el resto de colegas y las incluyan en, en, en sus eh, actividades académicas o como decía una panelista en la anterior sesión, eh, cuando la invitan a alguna actividad ella pregunta si hay más mujeres. Entonces, eh, este es un espacio valiosísimo para, para escuchar Thank todas esas historias. Your opinion are always, uh, very good and, uh, hacia el futuro. Yes, and yes. now we will go to Honduras. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. First for to Hazarika from India, as I already said, and then Lebanon. Bara Hassan to be prepared. Hazarika. Hello and uh, warm uh, good evening to all of you. I'm Prarthana. Well, um, I can very well relate to what Evelyn said and what Rika said. You know, when Evelyn said that, you know, um, we don't go out and do a story and, you know, simply give a smile and you get an exclusive story or a big story of the day. It's just that we work hard for it. We do our extensive research. We do our homework properly. And that's when we get a story. Um, and when she said that, you know, there are men who will always uh, be good to you. Yes, there were men who, you know, when I went inside a press conference, every time there will be certain amount of people who will try to pull you down saying, oh, you're looking fat, oh, you're looking um, tired, you know, stuff like that. But there will be certain amount, there, there were men, there were senior uh, people uh, like Mr. Borwa who have always supported and uh, some other people, you know, who will always come up. Ratana, yesterday I saw you breaking a very beautiful story on a particular athlete or your discussion on a, a particular sports show was really nice. So that is when your morale really goes up. I can very well relate to Rika when she said that when her mom asked her, how many times did you go to the washroom? Yes, I had a very bad experience every time I go to a, a stadium because uh, they do not think that there will be female journalists coming to this particular stadium or covering this prestigious event, be it FIFA or a World Cup or, you know, Commonwealth Games uh, or a lot of other stuff. A couple of months uh, back, there was uh, India and Sri Lanka T20 match in India. And uh, after a whole tired day of, you know, working, running from here and there, covering uh, different stories, I had to go to the washroom. And uh, to my utter surprise, that was a fantastic stadium, but the, uh, the, the ladies' washroom was not there. So two of my male colleagues were, you know, one, uh, one of them was holding my laptop back and the other was waiting outside the male washroom so that, you know, I can go and use that washroom and, you know, refresh myself. So these are the kind of things that's uh, happening. I think in the, a, a lot of women journalists can really relate to what I said and what Rika and Evelyn said. And I guess, um, yes, there are men who will always support you and there will be certain amount of people who will always try to pull you down. But nevertheless, um, like one of our panelists said, you have to do your homework well and you have to have that positive attitude and move forward. I guess uh, this is what I do nowadays and I'm extremely happy 
and uh, to, to have spoken this uh, small, small, minute experience throughout this digital seminar. And thanks to AIPS and Mr. Mado. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kazarika. Always nice to see you and always nice to hear you. Honduras then, Kenya Torres from Honduras. Hola, ¿cómo están? Eh, ya había tenido la posibilidad de saludarles en el primer eh, seminario. Eh, muchísimas gracias nuevamente a IPS por este tipo de iniciativas. Creo que después de escuchar las experiencias eh, de triunfo, de éxito, de todas estas mujeres, pues nos incentiva a seguir luchando eh, por otras mujeres. Quizás algunas ya lo hemos logrado, como es mi caso en Honduras. Eh, yo les contaba la otra vez que eh, soy la primera mujer periodista deportiva en ejercer eh, esta noble profesión en radio, en televisión. Eh, pues mi historia, sí, básicamente yo he tenido el apoyo de muchos hombres periodistas en el país que me abrieron las puertas de los principales medios de comunicación y no ha sido la historia de otras colegas aquí en el país a quienes les ha costado mucho más, pero eh, yo siempre les digo, las incentivo a seguir adelante, que no se detengan en procurar sus sueños y sus objetivos en esta profesión, se puede como lo decían algunas de las panelistas, hay que prepararse mucho, hay que capacitarse, no hay que retroceder y sobre todo quienes ya lo hemos logrado de alguna manera abrir el espacio para otras mujeres. Eh, en este momento eh, mi apoyo pues, ha sido tanto que eh, los colegas me están postulando para la presidencia de la Asociación de Periodistas Deportivos de Honduras, así que ahí vamos hacia adelante. Como bien lo decían, eh, vamos a encontrarnos con muchos problemas, eh, los que eh, se han tocado en este seminario, como es esa brecha salarial, por supuesto, el acoso y todo eso, pero hay que ponerse una coraza, hay que seguir adelante e incito a, a IPS que se sigan dando este tipo de seminarios, porque eh, con todas esas experiencias de mujeres en el mundo, pues nos hemos sentido como acuerpadas, como que el problema de una es de todas. Y así vamos a seguir, por supuesto, siempre eh, eh, haciendo más eh, corta esa brecha entre hombres y mujeres. Eh, hablo en términos generales en la sociedad. Así que ha sido un gusto por este medio conocerles a todas y a todos. Y muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Kenya. It is always a pleasure to hear you in this uh, kind of uh, matter. We will continue to do this promise you. And now we are going to Senegal. Sene Diakunda is with us and after her it will be one bit from uh, Republic Democratic du Congo. But first, Sene. Uh, thank you everybody. Thank you all panelists. Um, I'm like very pleased to be here um, sharing these experiences with this um, uh, women journalist. Um, I just uh, listening uh, the, the the story of uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Brennan, I just realized that you need more than journalistic skills to be a good female reporter. So I, my question is, what else do we need as women to have a successful career as you did? To whom? To Mrs. Brennan. To Ms. Brennan. Christine, it's your turn. Yes, hi there. Thank you for your question. So just to make sure I understood uh, what other um, traits and what other skills are you saying that, that are needed to succeed? Is that, was that the gist of the question? Yes. Yeah, I, I okay. just realized that it's more than journalistic skills. Right. Skills because, yeah. Yeah, so thank you, thank you. And um, certainly, you know, if you want something, you go for it with all your heart and all your soul. Uh, we all have those stories already, little things, big things. So uh, for me, I wanted this more than anything. I went to the U.S. University, to Northwestern University, undergrad and master's degree. I wasn't just, I didn't just graduate, I was launched like a rocket into what I wanted as my career of my dreams. So um, if you've worked hard for something, then you fight for it, right? And you want it, and you're going to make it work. And um, I think it's important to have mentors and role models. Now for me, most of my mentors and, and the people who helped my career were men. 
at least starting out, because I didn't really see women. There were a few women out there, but I didn't, there was no internet. So it wasn't like I could text or, or and there was no, you know, no cell phone. So you may have read a newspaper and I saw a woman was writing for the New York Times or the Boston Globe or the Los Angeles Times, but I didn't know them and I couldn't really correspond with them. And until I started bumping into them, uh, then, then you knew that you had this, this wonderful group of friends out there. But for the first couple of years of my career, it was basically all men and men supported me and men were, and men encouraged me and, and male editors gave me good jobs. So you need, you need support, you need your newspaper or your news organization to support you and you can demand support, especially now in 2020. If there's a problem, the things I described would be completely unacceptable now. And that's great news. And so you should have an editor or a boss, a, a producer, someone who, who supports that, you and who fights for you so you are not alone. But if you, if you are already prepared for this moment and you know, it's even little things like have a good, a couple lines ready to go. So if someone says something back to you, you know, your heart can be racing a little, right? And, and you get a little nervous, we all do. Be prepared for someone saying a woman doesn't belong here, you know, and just have it in your head. Yes, I do. I'm going to now ask you my next question. Don't get caught up in their game. You, you keep blinders on and you keep focused on what you're doing. And, um, and, it, and, but again, support is necessary and make sure to tell editors or tell your boss uh, or tell those around you if you are having trouble. Because back in the 80s, I didn't tell anyone. Now, of course, you tell people. And as I said now with that Washington Post reporting, three men uh, lost their jobs. They, they were forced out, they quit, whatever. And so there are results and you are not alone. And I said this the other day, but for those who aren't on it, one more second, I apologize for taking all this time, but the Association for Women in Sports Media. Any of you who didn't hear this the other day, AWSM, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, join if you'd like, but go to the website. But even if you don't join- yes, I will charge you for this marketing, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, there's no money involved. It's a pure labor of love. Yes, it's a volunteer. I was the first president, but we're there for you. And the point is, and I know you get it, you're, as is AIPS, Association for Women in Sports Media. Follow us on Twitter. And then my website is my name, christinebrennan.com. And I'm always willing to help. But, uh, Thank you, Christine, for that. Christine, Christine, but uh, I think that also you can join us. And so the, the world is bigger, no? <laughs> this is the, the, the solution. If not, it's only on, on one side, women. I think that women and men must, must be together. Or not. That's right, Johnny. And, and just to, so you know, and you know I agree with you completely, the Association for Women in Sports Media has many men in it. We are inclusive. We do not exclude men. We welcome men, and many are sports editors who are trying to look for great young women writers or, you know, just women in general, women in journalism. So, yes, men are absolutely involved, yeah. and I agree with you. It's time that, that you come with us also, because it's important, because also our association is making a cultural program every time with the award with everything to increase the level of the profession of, of everybody and so and for this reason i always call the top journalists around the world because we need to show that we can reach this, this point because without investment in culture we cannot change the world it's the only way so the most important is not to be divided but is to be united Yes, I'm pretty sure that it will be divided all, all the world after this seminar. But I see Rika. I think Rika has something to say on this matter. And Rika, we would like to listen to you because you were so, so anxious to say something. I, I have that expression. Rika? Well, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the world is becoming flat and all of us are here as a support group. And one of the things that, you know, I feel very strongly about today is uh, women being supported by a group of lawyers and uh, also a group of, uh, you know, mental trainer or maybe colleagues who they can reach out to 
for support. Um, as Eve was saying, the coronavirus pandemic was a time when many uh, women have been at, at home and have to do, had to do, do their job from home. It's been stressful conditions for them. They had to uh, live up to deadline. There has been there have been no people really to relate to, talk to. So either we build a support group through AIPS, or maybe have uh, uh, you know people who would uh, give mental support, mental trainers, because that's one of the things that is important and that we as women need as a support group to be able to perform to our potential and perhaps uh, even uh, punch above uh, our weight. In India, um, I can assure you there is no support group. I try and reach out to a lot of my women, uh, female colleagues and uh, even within in my workspace, I try to tell them if you have a problem, you can come to me, I can talk to you. But you know, that's a very limited space. If um, you know, we can build up a collective where other women journalists, other professionals can come to us with any problem and we can find a solution within us, that will perhaps be great. And, and perhaps, you know, that will be the success of a seminar like this if you're able to build a collective. Thank you, Rika. And uh, now one of the panelists uh, who was in our past sessions, but still interesting, is Zsuzsa Cistu from uh, Hungary. She's also an executive committee AIPS member. Zsuzsa, welcome. Welcome, Yura. Thank you for just uh, share some personal examples. Unfortunately, the gender backlash, it's something you only can find yourself in the situation in journalism. Uh, let me sorry when I was a postgraduate student uh, studying university. Sorry, I think we have Law. a Georgia's uh, connection. Opposite to me. Can you so, hear me? No, it, it is a problem for hearing you. Can you find a stronger internet if it's possible? Or we will wait you for several minutes. Uh, one bit from Democratic Republic of the Congo is now. Please uh, uh, try to put off your video, Zsuzsa, and then you can talk. But first, one bit from the Congo until you do these uh, technical things. Thank you, Zsuzsa. One bit from Congo. No, we don't. Oh, yes. Maybe now Zsuzsa is uh, clearer. Okay. Maybe. Yes. What about now? Is it better it's now? Better. It's, it's better. better. It's better. Right. Okay. So just only the story was that I was actually taking my exams at the University of Law from civil law when a man professor was sitting opposite to me and telling me that, listen, Zsuzsa, I was a well-known uh, television uh, reporter and uh, personality by then. by then. He was telling me that, listen, I know it is difficult with a woman's mind, but try to be logical. And he was also telling me that uh, you should tell me straightforward answers, not to talk so much bullshit what you're doing on television. So basically this man who was studying and uh, who was actually teaching at the University of Law, he was assaulting me, not just as a woman, but he was assaulting me, uh, obviously as a journalist in the same time. It was difficult to catch my breath back then, but what I decided that it was definitely a reason for me to, to try to do my work uh, as a maximalist way as I can uh, do it uh, even now. And, and look what is happening now. Here we are. We are talking about uh, women's role, women's situation, the gender backlash, and, and actually uh, the steps what we can do for each other worldwide. And uh, this professor, who was uh, actually a, a well accepted uh, personality at this university, he is not teaching anymore. More. Because it, he, it turned out he was uh, the person who was not assaulting only me, but it was basically a very good a very habit. So what I said, uh, Christine Brennan was actually uh, telling us, and I think this is a fantastic example, that if we unveil and uncover this kind of uh, uh, stories today, obviously not back then, not uh, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, but we can unveil it today and we can share this situation, I think that can help to encourage each other. And one more thing that I would like to ask uh, my colleagues, to my female colleagues, uh, what, no matter which country you are, try to make as big coverage as possible of these four uh, seminars of, of ours, of AIPS seminars. Try to find uh, as many coverage in newspapers, in, in uh, uh, newsletters, and to reach out and let people know uh, about the stories that we have been talking about in all these last four uh, 
the way how we can unveil these stories and reach out to each other. As, as far as I'm concerned, I'm trying to, to do a chance to the ministers, but also to send it to the Ministry of Justice. We have a female Minister of Justice and also obviously to do it in the media, in sports media, but not just in the sports media. Obviously, I would like to, to have uh, as many coverage as possible because I think this is the way how we can communicate our problem and how we can reach out to women who are not with us at the moment. Hopefully they will be. Agree with you, Zuzia, and thank you very much for this uh, promotion, which is very good to promote it all around the world. And uh, uh, now we are going to Mohamed Acheri. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me a chance uh, to talk to our colleagues. And um, I'm, I listened to all the, the stories that actually uh, to what happens to uh, our colleagues and it's uh, really shocking and uh, now uh, before that we have to, you know we have to, to know that it's it, there's a serious problem there is problem in the whole world i'm talking uh, about uh, my position i am in in morocco and i know so many friends that actually also female journalists and they also suffer you know somehow they have problems you know like of uh, you know when they are in the stadium or in a, in the event, they get you know it's uh, they look strange when uh, to to people and they, oh how come this lady she's amongst the, the other journalists which is for me I uh, it's uh, really shocking and they say well, it, we must be we must be one all together and we are male and female we are all one. And uh, what I heard from all uh, my colleagues now, it's uh, it's just it's not it's not something that is different to 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 the others and to our my colleagues in Morocco. It's the same thing, but we still you know the the serious problem is actually we have to 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 help each other you know to 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 change the mentality you know how we look to women's uh, generally and and if we actually look at these women as we are the same and we have all uh, we are all human beings and we have all the same rights and and uh, right of working on the media you know as a journalist uh, and if we we actually hug this this uh, women's our our uh, you know colleagues and be all part of of of, uh, of one one world then we will not suffer much but it's still there is a problem of of uh, culture that actually uh, always it's a problem that's uh, you know affect uh, this uh, this uh, uh, affect uh, us as journalists there is culture oh why these women oh, she's here she must be in the kitchen, she must, you know, it's it's uh, incredible. People, the way they think, it's it's. Uh, okay, Mohammed, we understand everything you say. Thank you very much, and uh, congratulations you, for this uh, thinking. And uh, now we are going to Iran. Mariam Majd from uh, Iran is uh, with us. Mariam. Yeah. Uh, hello. For yes, Mariam. We lose Can you hear me? Now, yes. No, no. Okay. Okay. First of all, I should say thank you, AIPs, for holding this informative uh, seminar and all great panelists. And please accept my apology for internet connection here because Zoom is uh, filtering, so we need to use a VPN. Uh, I really like to say uh, I'm a, a female photographer and um, then maybe for us as a photographer, this situation is different. And uh, I'm a sport photographer and photojournalism. I'm working in a news and a sports event. I'm always under the pressure of uh, obscenities and a beating or a treatment to break the camera. And sometimes uh, we are under pressure to be say, get out, get out, the any place. And yes, it's become normal for me and I accept that it's our job. However, many 
uh, believed that I'm a fighter photographer and I will never be silent and wrote about that. Um, I have a um, question of the panelists. Uh, do you see any uh, reaction from your male colleagues or uh, editors in this situation? Or do they try to support you when they see you in a threatening situation? Or uh, did you act, uh, expect them to support you? Uh, I would be thankful if uh, they um, answer my questions. Who? All of them? Um, I don't know. Um, okay, let's start with Rika. Yeah, okay, let's start with Rika. Okay. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Rika? Thank you very much. Manim, it's incredible work that you're doing, uh, being a photojournalist in the environment that you're working, but never uh, think that being abused or your camera being broken is normal. That is not normal. We live in a free world. And yes, uh, if something like that is happening to you, you have to reach out to your seniors. You have to reach out to your either male colleague or a female colleague and seek support. It is not normal to be abused and never accept anything less than good behavior. Good behavior is, some, is, is a minimum thing that we can expect from human beings. So you have, to, you have to stand up for yourself. You have to tell those people who, who are um, putting you down, who are being abusive towards you, who are breaking your camera, that this is not normal, this is not even civil. So you have to have to be civil with me. And if people are not being civil with you, then please, please take up the matter with your authorities. I don't know who your seniors are, but they should be able to answer. They should be able to give you some support and protection uh, uh, against all these abusers. And you're doing an incredible work. Yes, thank you, Rika. Dorothy, your opinion. Thank you very much, and I'm very sorry for your experience in, uh, in, in Iran. And uh, I do agree with, with Rika. And beyond reporting to your seniors at work, I would recommend that you document these experiences and uh, report them also to, uh, to the police and to human rights organizations, because human rights organizations are able to help and to support in this particular uh, kind of problem. Uh, they can be able to publicize this particular story. So, so there, for example, in Kenya, we do have a, a, a human rights organization that deals with issues to do with women called the FIDA. So, so look for such organizations and share your story with them and seek, your, seek their support so that uh, this is something that uh, needs to be publicized, it needs to be prosecuted, so that it doesn't happen to other people. So please look for support from various organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Also, we are uh, next to, to the end, but uh, we still have uh, time for one question or one opinion, and then we will give the floor to our panelists to finish this very interesting seminar. It will be from Nigeria, Yeoma Okigbo, Nigeria, for the final question or final opinion before we give the final words to our panelists. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Um, great. From all that we've discussed so far, I was able to sum up that um, mentorship and um, exposure, you know, is a great asset for young reporters. For my own end, hello, can you hear me? Hi. Hello. Uh, we yes, can't see you and we, we okay. hardly hear you. Okay, I don't know, my camera is a bit poor, but can you see no, me now? No, 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 the light is behind you, so just uh, turn around. Oh, the light is again, again behind you. Okay, you okay. have a question um, or you have an opinion? Yes, no, 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 it's an opinion, it's just a comment. Please, two minutes. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, from all that we have said so far, I've been able to sum up that men mentorship and um, exposure is a huge asset for um, the young reporters. You know, from all we've talked about, we young reporters, we need to have someone whom we look up to all the time, you know, a senior or even someone who's just your colleague, just someone who is at the same level with you. Like sometimes I read up people's story, like there's, there's a girl here, Chibogu, she writes well. I just see, I just read her work and see what she does. And I'm like, okay, 
if she, if Chibogo can write this, she, if she can do this, you know, she inspires me a lot, then I also can. So I also see that um, exposure, a lot of times we should also look for how we can try to attend events, try to go for events that are outside our locality, maybe events outside where you stay, outside your country. That's where you're able to meet up with, you know, colleagues outside and then, you know, see how people report stories, see how stories are from another view, from a different end. So I think with some of these, we'll be able to push, you know, especially we ladies, we'll be able to push what we do from our own end. Thank you so much, AIPS, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we are coming to our end of this uh, fourth session of this seminar. And now I would like to hear from our panelists uh, what, do, what did they learn or what did they find out uh, during these two hours. Uh, Goga, first, we are going to Mexico. Thank you, Jura. I'm going to talk in Spanish because there's yes, plenty thank you. of ladies from Latin America. Thank you for that. Uh, um, creo que hemos llegado a un punto en donde el colectivo tiene, tiene que ser nuestra gran representación. Ya no somos cinco, ya no somos diez. Somos una fuerza muy importante saliendo de las aulas, saliendo de la carrera de periodismo y creo que es necesario que este colectivo nos haga crecer. Eh, entiendo que todas estamos en una fase diferente de desarrollo y de carrera, pero si sí, las que están en el inicio o que en algún momento tienen un problema, pues eh, esta comunidad tiene que, que extender la mano, dar la experiencia, porque seguramente hemos vivido lo mismo que ustedes están pasando, o a mí me puede pasar algo que todavía no he vivido, pero que otras sí, Eh, y creo que el, el mensaje que tienen también mis, mis compañeras en este panel es que tenemos que ser solidarias con nuestras más cercanas colaboradoras. Eh, en, en mi caso, pues yo trataré siempre de estar abierta no solamente a, a las colegas que hacen ciclismo en el periodismo deportivo, sino pues en otras, en, en, en otras especializaciones del deporte, pero... pero Espero poder cumplir yo con eso. Espero poder ser también un, un conducto eh, para, para que el camino sea un poco menos, menos difícil. Pero no, no se dejen nunca eh, decir que son menos, no se dejen nunca eh, acorralar. Digan que no a, situ a situaciones difíciles. A veces nos cuesta a nosotras decir que no, a veces esos medios nos van a rechazar por decir que no, pero no, ustedes no pueden perder su, princi su principio de, de, de defender su posición como profesionales. Así que yo lo único que les recomiendo es confíen en su discurso, confíen en su preparación. Lo de afuera se acaba rápido, ustedes lo saben, y lo, y, y, y lo que tenemos eh, que ofrecer es otra cosa. La mente es nuestra mejor en nuestro mejor, eh, eh, nuestro mejor vehículo de comunicación. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much for this. Uh, now, Dorothy. Hey, um, I want to appreciate this opportunity to be with this phenomenal women and uh, to, to hear their stories. Uh, I think as we conclude, what I would like to say is for every one of us, is as women, we need to broaden our end, our horizons. We need to broaden our horizons. We need to really uh, reach out across the board. We all do different things and we all have different experiences. Uh, I am not a journalist. I am uh, you know, I am in the university. I'm, I'm, uh, in the, in the um, NGO world. But we have a role to play. Uh, you as a journalist have a role to play. But we are all doing our things very separately, yet our efforts if joined together can really be able to support. So for example, when you're going all through the things that you're experiencing, uh, we who are in academia can do research and be able to highlight what, the, what it's like for you uh, working in, uh, in media and in sports journalism. And uh, through that, we can be able to raise our voice, to advocate, and to make a difference. So I think we have failed to make those connections, and those connections are very important. 
The other thing I would like to encourage all of you and all of us is that it's really important to establish yourself very well as a professional. Uh, what, uh, so try and when you do good stories, try and win awards, try and uh, push your work. The more, you, the more you get recognized beyond your narrow circle, the more you get known internationally and nationally. Uh, the harder it becomes for people to come and intimidate you because you are a household name and all that. So really go for those awards. Really go out and uh, push yourself so that you, once you're a strong professional woman, I think it gives you space to lift others up and it helps you not to be so um, harassed by the others. So I wish you well and I hope that we can all work together to get where we want to go. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, three minutes of conclusion for christinebrenner.com. <laughs> Hi there, thank you. Well, again, thank you for this opportunity. It is a true honor for me to join so many of you and uh, thank you to AIPS. And yes, I will join. I think I joined once years ago, probably a previous century, Johnny. So I'll, I need to join in this century as well. So set, send me a link and you'll have my credit card in no time at all. Um, but it's interesting, and I mean that, I, I'm honored to do this. Um, I was just counting. I saw, uh, and maybe it's not seven screens now, but I went through seven screens of 25 people. So that's 175 people, if my math is correct, on this call today. Uh, that is extraordinary. For the fourth session, that there would be, you know, 175, give or take, uh, during two hours uh, at all different times for, of the day for people. Uh, that shows the power that's there. I, have, I mentioned this previously, there are well over a thousand women covering sports for radio, TV, newspapers, websites, blogs, you, you name it, photographers, camera people, writers, uh, well over a thousand in the United States alone. Uh, the power is there. Our numbers are there and we need to support one another. And we do. Uh, those old days, someone referred to this earlier about women not supporting women. We certainly saw that conversation during our 2016 US election when Hillary Clinton ran for president. Uh, and it's an important conversation to have, but it is a new day and women are supporting women. And the reason this happened in the past was only one woman would make it. So you'd had women fighting each other for one spot. Well, now there are many spots. And even in the midst of a pandemic, and even with the economic problems we have, I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, but we are so far advanced from where we were when I started my career. And I'm so honored and happy to still be doing my career at this level. And it makes me smile to see all of you. You're out there, you're doing this, you're trying. It's not always easy. Sometimes there are mistakes. Sometimes there are, you take a step back but to go two steps forward but the glass is half full, not half empty. I'm here for you. So many women are here for you and men as well. And I think we are going to embark on a great next decade or two of women being able to do whatever they want, which includes covering sports with our wonderful journalism and our ability to tell stories, uh, women and men working together as never before and the acceptance of women is better each day. So today is the greatest day to be a woman in journalism until tomorrow and then the next day and the next day so thank you again and best wishes to all of you thank you christine i'm sure that we will see each other this year but for the next years for sure i just want to tell you that it were it was 626 participants from 111 countries during these four sessions here present at this aips uh, seminar so for the uh, conclusion words three minutes to rika roy well, thank you very much, Jura. Ever grateful for giving me this opportunity to speak here. Uh, well, all I have to say is for us to be successful, there are two things that we need to keep in mind is to invest in our IQ, intelligence quotient, and EQ, emotional quotient. APS is doing, AIPS is doing enough for, you know, raising the bar in, when it comes to intelligence quotient. We have training and support opportunity which perhaps also needs to be enhanced over the years now emotional quotient for women is something that is uh, that is something really close to me and bothers me for 
women across the world uh, perhaps there are many women who do not find support within their system and they need people like us they need girlfriends like us they need sounding boards like us uh, to hear their problems give us solution so in aips if we can build a collective of women and men who can be their sounding board and help them through their career that will be wonderful and uh, perhaps then we can uh, see there is no template to making careers and to making successful careers but we do know that uh, there are few tools that every one of us who have years and years of experience on us can help support the generation next with and even our colleagues who are who've now been here for a long time need need to go to the next step of their career well you know as journalists we are very um we are very possessive about our voice possessive about our mug so i think jura you've given me the uh, perfect opportunity to sign off and i'm going to do the sign off with dorothy georgina and kristin this is rika roy for aips thank you thank you and thank you for this uh, we will be in touch for sure and before i give uh, the final words to our president mr mello i want to thank to all of the aips staff who was very active during these four seminars uh, barbara maria pia georgina stefania uh, who else matteo and andrea uh, so thank them and uh, mr president your is the final word It was a mute. Now they told my words. You have forgotten one. Also, Chibu. Chibu, yes, of course. I know. I knew I forgot one. <laughs> yes. So the most Sorry, important Chibu. thing is that uh, we came at, at the end. But before to the, the the last speech, I would like to speak about uh, what Mariam had said regarding Iran. No? I was in Iran a few times, and I've seen a little bit of evolution in the women journalism because I was surprised the first time in 2006 that I found many women working in the journalist, even in the national uh, agency, but with not the possibility to go in the stadium. And they were very angry about this. The, the ladies were very tough because they were very tough. Now it begins to open a little bit time by time and we will do always our best to help this procedure become quicker and we will always defend the right of everybody and it was very important even during this uh, seminar the intervention of, of the woman of the college in Saudi Arabia and there are some area that they are opening step by step and we, we must facilitate this work because the most important thing for our association is to open doors to discuss how to open the doors because uh, we are a kind of cultural association that has to, has to fight for the right of our profession because our profession is very important because it means culture. We are defending also principles, we are defending uh, the, the, the right uh, way in which sport must be done because sport is also education and we have to fight also against uh, the corruption against the match fixing against this thing because we have to work together in this men and women because every man has at, at least a mother so uh, women are stronger than us no we try to survive now because there will be a big wave of women coming and we are very happy about this but we have to work together now it's time also that we stop to speak as a woman or a man but we must speak as human beings that we have to go together in, a, in one direction. Because the problem, because if not, it will be easy to divide us, no? Because the power won't always to divide the people. It's normal. But we have to avoid this. There are no more only men or women journalists. There is only journalists that has to defend some principle. And on this we must be very tough. Christine is a very tough girl. I, I, you know, we know each other many years ago. I hope that she can send me the photo of, this, of the press uh, tribune in Los Angeles because I was there. Perhaps I can find also myself over there because it was a, it was a big thing. And we know how it, how it is difficult sometimes, how it was difficult, but we have to continue. 
we have to continue to fight together. But not looking to a woman or to a man. No, looking as human beings that wants a better life for everybody. This is the point. In the future, I hope that we have not to speak anymore about women and men. We are speaking about citizens of the world. That this is the problem. Because the problem that we have seen, I think that everybody has understood, that the same problems are everywhere. Because in this seminar was represented the world, really, with all the country, with all the, the different experience. So we have to go in one direction, all together. And this is very important, because it's important that we go in this direction. So for this reason, I'm, I'm very glad, and I must say that our staff has done a wonderful job, especially because they always are supporting me, no? Because to live with me in the office is not so difficult, and I'm surrounded by women. In, in my office, there is 80% of women. Eh? I'm a minority. I have to fight for, for my rights every day. So you can understand. I, I, and I understand completely. I, I see that Chibu now is smiling. For example, if I say so, no? Chibu or, or Mapier song. But I think that if we work to get together properly, we can go really the right direction. And I thank also our Vice President Ibrahim uh, Bata that has spoken at the beginning. I must thank Shusha, uh, that is a member of our executive committee that are working together in this direction. So I hope that everybody of you has enjoyed this uh, fourth session. But now our work is not finished because now when the girls will come back here, we have to begin to, to think about the next uh, organization of the let's talk about Champions League with our mentors on Tuesday. And after, let's talk also about our award. I think that, Christine, sometimes you can also take part in this award because you are a leader in opinion. And in our award, it's important. Our, we are creating a new culture. Last year, there was 1,756 uh, submissions in eight categories. Is a great number, it's a great success. 124 countries participate to our award. But now we have to give, as journalists, we have to begin to speak also sometimes about us. Because the problem of the journalists is that why we are so divided? Because sometimes we are not speaking about our, our rights. We are not speaking about how we organize very well the thing. Why? Because everybody of us is, is so humble. Or sometimes it's not humble, it's selfish. We have to finish to be selfish. We have to think to, to a bigger idea. And for this reason, it's time that sometimes of you, when somebody of you will, will speak, not about a president or so on, about an organization, to show that there exists an organization that is fighting to defend the principle. It's not a small thing, it's culture. So I hope that everybody of you after will help us also to grow because if we are growing, we will have more people around the world because we are fighting for our independence, for our freedom, because this is the most important in this moment in which with the social media, the freedom is not bigger than before, but is in a big danger. No, it was yesterday the case that in the, in the Congress, the, the top guy of the top uh, social media were there to defend themselves because social media is a wonderful tool, but if it's used in the proper way. So, to defend our freedom, and we will continue to defend our freedom. I hope that you agree on this, but you know, this is my opinion, and I'm only a journalist. At the end, I'm only a journalist. Okay? Thank you, so, John. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you to our Vice President, Evelyn Vata. You have mentioned, Jenny, also to Juja, who is our EC member. Thank you all to be with us, and soon we will be together. Bye-bye.